Okay, hi everybody. Welcome to our Money View Reading Group. This week we are doing our second discussion of Perry Merling's The Money Interest and the Public Interest. We're talking about chapters three and four of the book. So chapter three is The Age of Management and chapter four is The Art of the Swap. Um, I think the main thread through this book is uh, market liquidity and the um, the use of market liquidity, um, being able to sell an asset uh, in order to um, you know, get money and make payments and stuff like that. Uh, so chapter three talks about World War, uh, Great Depression, World War II, um, the Fed kind of uh, setting the prices of government debt directly. Um, so they're basically promising market liquidity at all time. Uh, if you wanna sell your T-bill or your T-bond, um, they will, buy it and, and vice versa um, in such a way that they keep the, the interest rates um, where the government wants them. Um, then after World War II, uh, a bunch of stuff happened, um, trying to kind of uh, resuscitate the private dealer market, um, you know, trying to get, um, you know, the Fed quoting bad prices. So, um, you know, dealers would come in and say, hey, I can quote a better price and make a profit, that kind of thing. Uh, uh, getting the private market back. Um, and then chapter four uh, talks about how the private financial sector tried to uh, maximize market liquidity or shiftability of assets on their own through um, swaps and, and hedging through swaps, credit default swaps and uh, uh, interest rate swaps and foreign exchange swaps uh, that allowed you to um, have kind of a synthetic uh, treasury security, um, something that that would ideally uh, be liquid in the market uh, kind of at all times. Um, the first part of chapter four, uh, uh, Merling introduces the idea of a swap through talking about uh, foreign exchange swaps, currency swaps. And uh, this is, there's an interesting discussion there that gets into interest rate parity and stuff like that. Uh, and he uses that as a jumping off point for talking about swaps in general uh, and the kind of, you know, the way the financial system was up until the, the 2008 uh, crash. Uh, but you can also use that as a jumping off point for exploring and trying to understand global money. Um, so so that, that particular section in chapter four um, was interesting uh, to me, uh, where he talks about the uh, currency swaps and the uncovered interest parity norm. Um, and it's also the part where um, I kind of spent the most time and effort thinking at it uh, and trying to, you know, what's the quoting convention and is the dollar overvalued or undervalued and you know like what so so we can talk about that when we get into chapter four but i'm curious to hear uh, other people's thoughts i've also done up balance sheets uh for some of the stuff in chapter three like talking about you know the difference between targeting uh borrowed reserves versus free reserves and stuff like that so we can talk about uh that kind of stuff too i'm curious to hear uh, other people's initial thoughts about these two chapters Well, I think uh, just one thought that kind of comes uh, to mind at, at a high level is um, <clears throat> I think you're right that a major theme here is market liquidity. But in some ways, I think it's it, it's kind of two things, right? There's this focus on market liquidity, but also kind of like how we get there and its relationship to other kinds of liquidity and, and liquidity in general. I mean, Kind of throughout, you know, especially in, in chapter three, there's this kind of idea of, you know, how are we thinking about money and how are we thinking about asset pricing, you know, in a way that kind of abstracts from liquidity generally. And, you know, of course, in, in you know, there are, and, and especially more now than even really when the book was written, you know, there are models that, you know, think a little bit more carefully about, you know, liquidity in, in one way or another. But um, I think that this kind of connection between uh, funding liquidity and market liquidity is, you know, particularly interesting because one, at the time that he's writing it, you know, a, a lot of the kind of economics um, literature has not kind of really worked out some of the potential connections here. I mean, I think there's a very uh, big paper from Bruner Meyer and Peterson on the relationship between funding liquidity and market liquidity that comes out in maybe 2014, 2013. Um, and of course, the working paper versions before that. And so, you know, but it's it's really around this time that, 
know, people are starting to try to think about this in in a little bit more of an explicit way. And so I think it's one area where you know he's <clears throat> kind of very ahead of the curve. And I think it's kind of an important, it's an it's an important, uh, I mean, it is kind of in, in my sense, the crux of the, the book <clears throat> and, and a lot of the idea here, which is, you know, in some ways we kind of already had a problem when we were thinking about central banking and monetary policy prior to the crisis, just focusing, you know, just because we were having difficulty thinking, you know, incorporating liquidity in our models in general. Um, but then the crisis demonstrated that it's not really even just the kind of classical funding liquidity that we might think about in kind of a lender of last resort uh, sense, but also the way in which this is related to kind of the shadow banking sector that end up playing such a big role. So I, I think that there's kind of, yeah, two big parts here. There's the traditional kind of how do we think about kind of liquidity and, and they're really thinking about funding liquidity and how do we incorporate that and kind of monetary policy and asset pricing and these kinds of things. But then the second part, which is this kind of financial structure point, which is how does that shift um, or how does that relate from funding liquidity to market liquidity in this more shadow banking type environment? Yeah, so uh, on that point, I uh, think that uh, one of the most interesting things from the from chapter three was to uh, for me, uh, at least, was to to find out uh, how how ahead of the curve uh, to, to to borrow the expression means to us, uh, and how if interesting it, it it was to see that he was already kind of trying to 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 find this this third way, being stuck between uh, uh, Keynesians like Tobin, the the monetarists like like Friedman, to to try to find a place for money in. Um, in, in, in the macro thinking of the age. But what's uh, what's striking to me is that not much has changed at least until 2008, right? We we still had the um, uh, more of the uh, monetarist or, or less a fair wing. Um, and the, the, the Keynesians were, were pretty uh, uh, more silent than, than uh, following the, um, uh, their, their peak impact in, in the 60s and 70s. But, but nevertheless, the, the, the new Keynesian uh, thinking abstracted from um, abstracted from money and and focused on on the interest rate. So we had we, we were stuck in this in this either or uh, abstracting away from yeah from the liquidity and uh, and essentially the the whole payment and and uh, financial infrastructure that was underpinning the the, the whole system. Um, and this uh, what Perry writes is that. Uh, the the movement between academia and, and policy was only only one way. So the the academia was influencing policy, but there was no kind of feedback loop that the policy would then uh, spark some uh, some research that would be much more in line with uh, uh, with the real life uh, way of doing transactions with uh, all the all the markets that have developed uh, in the in the post war uh, post war decades. Uh, and I think that's one of the one of the biggest uh, one of the biggest causes of uh, of the lack of essentially lack of understanding. Uh, even 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 today, if you I think look at the at the economic profession, the the the, the lack of understanding of the mechanisms of, of 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 banking of international monetary system is is quite astounding. Uh, and I would say it's still because we didn't manage to kind of car carve out enough space to uh, to think about to think about the money and and financial system uh, and 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 we are stuck between uh, people saying that it's only money that matters or uh, money doesn't matter and um, and so forth um two two quick things one uh just a, a quick uh revision for my my previous uh comment it turns out that the Bruno Meyer Peterson paper on funding and market liquidity came out uh, a few years earlier, I thought, in like 2008. Um, but still, I think that this is something that you know people, you know, it's not something that kind of worked its way into the macro literature. It's something kind of a, a bit siloed in the in the kind of finance literature. Um, second, and this is kind of the point you were just making. Yeah, it's interesting this kind of this tension between. Uh, whether we're thinking about kind of money or interest rates, because on the one hand, 
um, you know, it, it, you know, Perry makes this point several times through the book, and, and I think it's right, and it makes sense that people kind of um, often we're not taking money kind of very seriously or, or thinking about the kind of institutions or mechanisms um, that that make money kind of important. On the other hand, like I'm I'm sympathetic to the interest rate point of view in the sense that you know I, I think that kind of what matters for kind of monetary conditions are are the interest rates as opposed to you know the quantity of money or something. And so I think you know one of the things that he kind of says and and maybe you know maybe I'm kind of teasing this out a bit more uh, than he would, but I, I think that a lot of it is kind of like what is the interest rate representing? And you know, he talks about the kind of different theories of the interest rate, whether it's kind of intertemporal substitution or, you know, liquidity preference or, or this kind of thing. Um, and so even if we kind of do end up uh, focusing on the interest rate as, as I would, it still may be very different than the kind of the interest rate that is often discussed in a lot of macro models that um, treat or assume money to be uh, of, of a particular kind of quality. So I think, um, yeah, that there's this kind of tension between the kind of money versus interest rate view, but there's also this kind of question of like, well, from either of those perspectives, kind of what, what are, what are the kind of institutional assumptions that we're making about the, the kind of underlying money? Yeah, and um, when, when the theory is assuming away uh, liquidity or assuming that everything is perfectly liquid at all times, uh, what Perry points out is that the policymakers then kind of approach things um, from this uh, you know, perfect uh, liquidity norm uh, perspective. So they had this idea of kind of what the fundamental uh, values were, and they wanted to bring the prices, um, you know, kind of in line with the fundamental values or allow them to, to um, line up with what they thought the fundamental values were. And those fundamental values were um, whatever value was associated with perfect liquidity. Um, so they're trying to kind of make, make the real world match their theory. Uh, but if everything is perfectly liquid, uh, Perry points out that well, then maybe your policy is is biased toward ease. You know, there's a reason why um, why you have to pay um, you know a liquidity premium. And if you remove all of those and you make everything perfectly liquid, um, then you might run into some some trouble there. Yeah, I think it's worthwhile to point out uh, what's really valuable is I think the discussion that Perry has in, the, in these two chapters, points out how liquidity got lost, right? How do we get away from the classic central banking mandate? You know, what the, the lender of last resort function uh, that we all understand. Um, it's where we sort of solve that problem, tuck it away, and we never have to think about it again. And now we move on to other, other issues. Uh, and I think also, I think this whole sort of general Keynesian macro stabilization, focusing on other measures beyond what Minsky actually, that's the reading we did last year. Minsky's of course starting point was the survival constraint. The fact that starting from a very crucial thing, like if you can't make your payments, you're dead. And that's the key starting point also for um, the classic central banking viewpoint, I would say. So I think that's just something that we've moved away from, from in the academic literature and in some in many de developments, the whole thing is just pointing away that uh, uncovered interest parity, and these other uh, parodies, these other relationships that Perry points out in this chapter basically mean, these are an idealized form, but they basically mean they never hold. So there is a price, there is um, liquidity has to cost something. So there are, there are dealers who have to make, provide the liquidity. So it's not a free good. So the entire foundation of, of, of all these theories that we have are based on the fact that we have liquidity as a free good. And once we get this as an accepted norm, then you abstract from it because you're focusing on other problems, but then you we've also essentially in the modern crisis completely un, misunderstood what the actual objective is, uh, what the tools are that we were actually able to use in order to to solve uh, the mo the modern variation of shift shiftability, right? So how do how, how do we adapt to the core mandate of the central bank, which is to uh, to backstop um, not funding liquidity, as Win said earlier, 
but uh, and Alex, you said earlier, but also now market liquidity, like there's a liquidity provision function, understanding the system as it's evolving. What Perry actually says is that, and this is something that's actually controversial in my view, but he says this is a natural evolution of the system, this is a natural adaptation of, uh, that's also what, what chapter four is about, essentially sort of to say how we're breaking down breaking down all these these various barriers uh, between those different markets. You can't sort of um, have good Goodhart's law hold, um, but you're trying to exploit uh, empirical relationships for policy objectives. Um, so these are things we can get into in a second too. But I really like uh, like the way how Perry spells out why we lost liquidity in the first place and how we have to re uh, capture again this initial idea of what liquidity actually means, the different variations of liquidity, and what the system actually looks like um, today, um, and what kind of liquidity provision we actually require. And for me, actually, as a sympathetic as I am to Win's point, like interest rates matter, of course, more so than money supply. But I think uh, that's a secondary question to the primary function of central bank is to be the lender of last resort slash updated version dealer of last resort. That is the primary function. The other things are optional or could be dealt with in other ways too. We have other mechanisms and there, we, we don't necessarily have to have the central bank dealing with all any and all problems. But this is the key problem that central banks actually was originally designed for and, and tasked with. And, uh, and the other issues are something that is in a general macro management sphere. And we've moved into that space only, not, 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 not thinking about what the primary uh, objective of the central bank was initially. So um, I, like, I like that he's teased out that, that aspect in those two chapters. Yeah, I, uh, I, 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 I totally agree. I mean, you know, I, I think um, that and, and, and in some ways, it's something that I think central bankers kind of rediscover every crisis. I remember Bernanke gave this kind of short course on uh, what the Fed did during the crisis um, at GW, which I think is online somewhere. And most of it is stuff that, you know, anyone who kind of follows this stuff knows. But it's interesting. I mean, he emphasizes from the start that, you know, what the most important things that the Fed did was not change interest rate policy, but to return to its kind of original function as a as a lender of last resort. And I, I mean, I agree that I, I think that that's kind of above all the primary kind of function of the, the central bank. Um, but, you know, so yeah, a, lo a lot of kind of interesting thoughts here. One thing that I think is interesting to kind of think a little bit about is, I mean, he says, you know, liquidity is kind of treated as something that's free. Um, I think there's kind of two interesting kind of questions to go down here, which the, the first is, you know, is that kind of speaking in general terms? Is it is it free or is it just cheap? Or, you know, what do we think it, how, how should we think about the cost of liquidity relative to something? What should the ben benchmark be? And, you know, I mean, even, even in place, you know, kind of even in environments where there really is kind of, for example, um, the ECB has this fixed rate full allotment facility where essentially banks can provide collateral and, you know, as long as they're kind of in decent standing, get uh, unlimited necessary funds provided they have collateral. Now, of course, there, there are still costs. I mean, the ECB sets the interest rate on that. And, you know, there are the costs of maintaining the collateral and, and all these kinds of things. Um, so, yeah, I think w one question is kind of, thinking kind of about the nuts and bolts of, you know, what makes liquidity cheap or, or expensive and, and relative to, to what uh, kind of benchmark. Another part, which is not, you know, too really explicitly taken up in this book, but has been in, in some of the prior readings that we've had, is, you know, some of these different kind of conceptions of money, you know, one is this kind of more uh, commodity oriented uh, view of money, which is often kind of implicit in the back of a lot of the current macro models where money is treated just as some other good that is a numeraire um, versus a more kind of credit view of, of money where, you know, money is something that's kind of created through lending. And, you know, while it doesn't come up at least so far in the book too much, uh, it comes up in the course and, uh, and some other, you know, and, and other things we've kind of read and discussed. I think this is kind of also an interesting perspective on thinking about you know, what does it mean for liquidity to be kind of, uh, you know, cheap or expensive or this kind of thing? Because in some sense, you know, it, it should be relative or proportional to or connected to, 
the kind of uh, the the credit side of things, assuming that you take that point of view as opposed to the commodity point of view. And so, you know, maybe on a more theoretical perspective, that that's kind of another interesting direction to go in for thinking about um, this kind of idea of whether liquidity is kind of free or, or cheap or or what have you. Yeah, um, I wanted to speak quickly to the primary function of the Fed um, being kind of to act as lender of last resort, uh, which uh, Perry extends to dealer of last resort uh, and ensuring kind of smooth function of, of the banking system and the financial sector. Um, I think that's I think that's an important thing to pay attention to because um, you know, he talks about the Employment Act of 1946, uh, and when they originally did that, you know, they had these goals of, of what? Uh, promote maximum pl employment, production, and purchasing power. So these are all things that we expect the central bank to do today, uh, and they didn't expect the central bank to do that at all back in 1946. They expected the central bank, they expected the Fed to just fix the price of government debt. So they were acting as a dealer of first resort in treasuries um, and uh, ensuring perfect market liquidity for treasuries. So if anything, you know, it might have been a kind of an oversimplification of, of how this, the Fed might act optimally, but it's kind of a, a, a you know, kind of a distillation of, of what we're saying the central bank is supposed to do, which is to, um, you know, they're talking about ensuring perfect market liquidity, but that's kind of the, the central, we're talking about the central bank needing to be somewhere on that spectrum of, of ensuring that there's sufficient liquidity, that things don't break down and stuff like that. And not any of any of the other stuff that's in the Employment Act. Um, and some of that other stuff, I think, you know, Perry talks about it got brought in uh, because people uh, like Irving Fisher were connecting um, kind of inflation and deflation and employment and all of these other things with financial stability. So maybe those things are important goals. Um, I think some of them are and some of them aren't. Um, but perhaps the, the mistake that we made or a big mistake that we made was uh, connecting them up uh, with the idea of managing uh, the banking sector and, and financial stability. Um, yeah. Um, just, uh, just on that point. So let, let, yeah. let, let's just tease that out for, for a little bit. I think, so I'm not entirely certain if Perry disagrees with, uh, with anybody I think that's actually the beauty of Perry. Perry doesn't explicitly say, I disagree with this or that position. Um, but I think he disagrees with the overemphasis on certain relationships, right? I think if we forget liquidity uh, and if we just stabilize money supply, that's not enough, right? Money supply as an abstract concept, you need to, and there where Perry would say, it's about where the money is in a certain moment. Can you directly give a cash injection where it's needed so the so liquidity uh is provided to those who need to know that specific situation. So that, so this is kind of like, I'm personally not a big fan of uh, of, of these sort of general macro uh, money supply ideas. I'm not I'm not on that, but I think Perry's not rejecting them outright. But I think he's sort of like saying, okay, this is not necessarily consistent, but just saying, okay, um, we can't sort of be nebulous about this. There's a very clear starting point. Minsky was the thing he mentioned, and also the old Goodhart stuff, survival constraint. Payment has to be made be made now. That person needs to have access to liquidity for this specific moment in time, and not in some abstract money supply way or some other way that's, that other people are talking about. So, so that's actually what I think Perry's getting at here a little bit in sort of saying, "Hey, let's re-resurrect the actual function that we need to manage the payment system and manage the liquidity, um, which is actually not." It's not a management uh, function at all of the macro economy. There was no macroeconomics when central banking initially uh, was invented. So this is a very different function, right? So uh, we need to be very clear about this. And I'm not sure, maybe you read something different, but I don't think Perry was critiquing uh, the approach to somehow tie the price level and macro stability uh, as some, some objective that potentially, potentially central bank could be also taking into consideration um, if it also has in place a very clear understanding of its liquidity function uh, as, as a backstop for that as well. I'm just wondering if maybe you, you read something different, but I'm just curious what, what, you, what you've been seeing there. Well, I, maybe I read something different into the text. Um, yeah, uh, I, I like uh, that Perry uh, tries to remain neutral, and then you know I just kind of imprint my my opinions on him, and it feels it feels um, correct. Um, but 
but yeah, so um, it's it's interesting the kind of part of it is causation, right? Like what causes what? Like you could like you could imagine that all else being equal, uh, um, you know, a credit collapse or a liquidity downward spiral might cause deflation. But is preventing deflation going to prevent a liquidity downward spiral? No, we had a liquidity downward spiral in two thousand eight, and we didn't have deflation. Um, so so I think. I think part of this is you're right, uh, of course, to point out, Jay, that that a lot of these things are connected um, with each other. Um, but then, um, if you start targeting the wrong thing, then you break the correlations. You know, the Goodhart's law thing. So that's something uh, to pay attention to as well. Yeah, I think uh, in another kind of interesting point here on kind of connecting some of these ideas to to or connecting kind of central bank. Um, policy to kind of more macro ideas is, you know, he, he presents a little bit the, the kind of perspective that you get from, you know, a lot of standard macro models these days. But then he also kind of talks about this kind of alternative perspective, which is one where kind of uh, credit and, and finance kind of don't manage themselves, right? That there, you know, are these kind of, he, he talks first about, you know, Hantry and then about uh, Minsky. And in, in these kind of perspectives, there, there is kind of a macroeconomic function for uh, central banks, but it's, it's very different than kind of purely focusing on kind of Taylor Rule-esque, you know, unemployment and inflation balancing. Instead, it's about kind of managing the cycle. And it's interesting because I think, you know, and this is not something that comes up in the book. It's more just, you know, from reading other things by, by Perry. You know, I, I get the sense that he is, you know, often a bit reserved about some of the, you know, multitude of functions that people would like to foist on the central banks. And I think that that's pretty reasonable. But here, you know, he, in, in some ways, is is more comfortable with that when it comes to kind of managing, you know, say, credit booms and credit busts and that kind of thing. I mean, you know, for example, you know, people often talk about kind of greening central banks and maybe it's a good idea, maybe it's not. But, you know, one of the complaints that you get about that is that, well, you're picking winners and losers and this could go into kind of other areas. But he talks about how, you know, if you take a perspective on the macro economy that it is in some ways inherently unstable and that, you know, the role of the central bank is to kind of, I mean, in some ways, I, I guess it sounds a little bit like traditional monetary policy, lean against the wind, but instead of kind of leaning against the wind in terms of like real outcomes, like, you know, growth, employment, inflation, this kind of thing, instead you're leaning against the wind in terms of uh, the financial sector and financial imbalances. And, you know, in, in his kind of uh, take here, he suggests that one way to do that would be to kind of, you know, you, I think he said this, to use, you know, say the discount window and collateral policy and these kinds of things in order to privilege, you know, uh, productive credit instead of, you know, speculative credit and, and this kind of thing. And so, you know, I, I think that's interesting. I mean, we read the book by Eric Monet, where there's also this kind of idea where, you know, they, the central bank in France was, I mean, it, it was using different tools, but it had kind of a perspective on, you know, uh, macroeconomic dynamics that was similar, that was kind of focused on financial balances and focused on kind of, um, you know, discouraging, you know, the kind of speculative investment that might contribute to financial cycles. And so I, I think it's interesting because there's, there's still this kind of leaning against the wind idea that is very familiar to kind of modern macro, but it's kind of focus and, and objectives and, um, and mechanisms is, are, are very different. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I guess the question is, what wind do we want to, to lean against? And I think there are kind of a, a few different winds. There's like inflation, deflation, there's um, uh, liquidity and, and credit instability. Um, yeah. And, and I think, you know, I think it, it probably is useful to lean against different 
uh, different things that uh, different trends that are that are happening uh, in the economy. And the question is, um, which ones is it appropriate for the central bank to address? And is it possible as a bank to which which ones can you influence? Right. Um, certainly, as a central bank, you can be a lender of last resort. Uh, if you're a lender, right, that's what a bank does. Um, if you're doing that, uh, to what extent can you achieve goal, goals with respect to, you know, employment or, um, you know, inflation or or uh, any of that kind of stuff? Um, it's not clear to me that that a central bank can be a single institution that does all all of these things without really changing um, what it's allowed to do. Almost like a central bank, you know, do you want to have it do the equivalent of fiscal policy, that kind of thing? Um, does it make sense uh, to uh, maybe separate out uh, the things that you know we can all fit into one category and can be managed in a certain way? I know uh, Perry likes to talk about uh, you know Ralph Hawtrey, the art of central banking, rather than having it be automatic. But to what extent is there some stuff that we just know how to do and it can be technocratic and we can separate that out and have it be in its own institution uh, and and then not have it mixed in with the stuff that we really do kind of need to um, be more, um, I don't know what the word is, but uh, uh, active, actively manage and, and, and think about our decisions with. Um, because if you, if you mess up the stuff that's kind of, you know how to do, um, because you're, you're mixing it in with the stuff that you're uncertain about, then, uh, then that's not good, right? Just very quick on this last point. Well, uh... Can we have rules or not? Uh, I think it's, uh, it's it's going into a, a little bit of a detour or uh, or side conversation. But I think the Goodhart's law kind of thing, like once you have sort of things that are predictable that the market can model, the you know, Goodhart's law is basically saying the market will find out what the rule is and they will model against it and exploit it. And you know the fact is that the art means that you have to be nebulous. You have to actually manage these things. You don't want people to know before you announce things. And I think there's it's a, it's a bit more than than simply saying, because of financial innovation, the system's always changing. So I think any rule actually makes no sense because innovation will always change the underlying equation of what you're trying to model and what you're trying to rule against. And that's, I think, the if you had a static game, I think rules might make sense to be more fair and all these things that come with it with rules that are, uh, but I think the art is always emphasized because it's a social social evolution here ha happening and, uh, and we're reconstructing the fact what we're always been saying in this group as well is that constantly and also the theme of this financial innovation basically you think a relationship holds but then all of a sudden you have a financial innovation uprooting whatever you've modeled and then basically you're back to square one uh, and trying to re reconfigure what the objective is so i'm just um i'm, I'm pretty skeptical about the rule-based stuff but i'm so, also just uh, cu I'm curious um also like if we can talk about the specific rule here like uh, tobin and um I'm curious, like exactly how, what the progression was, because people were trying to implement and exploit certain relationships, and they've been trying to do stuff in a certain way that Perry actually is, is quite critical of. I'm just quite trying to figure out if we can sort of walk walk through those specific instances a little bit in this chapter three. Yeah, I, I'm curious about that too, um, but I also want to push back on the um, automatic rules. Um, so Goodhart's law says when a measure becomes a target. Uh, it ceases to be a good measure. Um, but if you're targeting the actual thing that you want, right, rather than uh, a measure of something else or an indicator of something else, um, then it's not about, you know, you don't have to worry about the thing you want to change deviating from the correlated um, measure that you modeled that you happen to be targeting, right? So you can, there are ways to kind of use policy in a rule-based way to achieve the outcome you want if the outcome is the actual thing uh, that you're targeting, right? Yeah, the only problem I have, and if this is in the text specifically, the only problem I have with that is that we're not targeting some sort of numbers or specific things, like what does 2% mean? You're actually targeting behavior and the behavioral equation is also changed by you applying the rules. So you can't sort of take behavioral equations as fixed. And that's the key thing that Goodhart actually points out. It's, it's ludicrous to think that you can target uh, abstract uh, measures or abstract sort of whatever target it is, money supply or other things, because you're actually trying to influence behavior, which is, a, is another thing you cannot assume to be constant and that thing changes based on the rule you apply. So there's a feedback loop that's never, you're never gonna get, get ahead of the curve if you, if you apply that 
specific thing. And that's actually why I think the art of central banking is how to actually capture that behavioral aspect. That's what the art is about, that behavioral aspect, how to influence uh, behavior with your action without giving them, taking not too much, and be able to uh, do whatever the objective is without being able to be exploited against. You don't want people to exploit your, your own rules and behavior and use it against, against you because obviously if there was some sort of killer rule that we could have right now, we would have it already because there's plenty of people that are much more comfortable with very transparent rules and objectives uh, than, than somehow what's going on currently. And there's a reason we have this sort of art of central banking as an emphasis compared to the technocratic nature of central banking that is completely abstract and fair and everybody uh, democratic leg legitimate or something. There's, there's plenty of push for that, but the, that is an illusion, I think. I think we have to, I don't think we can go down that road uh, uh, based on, on that, in that particular um, insight that Goodhart put, made in that, in that, in that point. Really my personal opinion, but I think I just want to point that out that we're targeting not just abstract, uh, not only money supply, for instance, we're also, it's behavioral, uh, a behavioral uh, aspect we're also trying to target. And that is the feedback that we're trying to understand. Yeah, this is, you know, I, I don't know exactly where this kind of fits in on, on the kind of two sides of this issue that you've kind of highlighted, but I think, you know, also often when we're talking about rules and we're talking about monetary policy, the kind of things that we have in mind are like Taylor rules or, you know, uh, money growth rules or something like that. But, um, but you know, I, I think there are lots of other kinds of, you know, things that we could call rules. Maybe maybe we should call them something different to, to avoid, you know, the unnecessary baggage that, you know, um, maybe still have some of the same kind of concerns, but, you know, maybe also mitigate some of them. So, you know, for example, you're just talking about how, you know, maybe say there are, you know, to oversimplify kind of two perspectives on the macro economy, one in which, you know, you kind of have cycles that are driven by the real side of the economy. And, you know, when unemployment gets too low, inflation goes up, and you're always trying to treat these things off. And, you know, you're, you're kind of trying to balance those things. And maybe that's kind of a, a Taylor rule perspective or something, um, you know, and then there's this kind of alternative perspective that he discusses where there's this kind of financial instability and what you're trying to do is kind of lean against, um, you know, the kind of credit growth. And so you know, we read, for example, in the Eric Bonet book where, you know, they would say, oh, you know, we'll have a rule where a bank, you know, cannot grow its credit more than 10% a year or something, right? Um, or, you know, and, and in the Monet book, he also talks about how, you know, many, many of these, you know, kind of what are more or less kind of macro prudential tools, um, could be, you know, they didn't have to be very specific. They didn't really have to be rule rules. They could be, you know, um, guidance, you know, from the supervisors for any given bank, depending on its kind of lending and whether it's a priority sector or not. Um, you could imagine, you know, very simple rules. I mean, I, you know, some of these, I imagine like, you know, at the discount window, you can use certain kinds of loans and, and not other kinds of loans, which then, you know, encourages the kind of liquidity and, you know, growth of certain types of credit you think are maybe more productive and discourages ones that are maybe, you know, more speculative. And, you know, to the extent to which these are very high level, um, you know, they may kind of create uh, sectoral distortions, which could be good or bad, depending on whether you think the kind of natural state of affairs is stabilizing or, or destabilizing. But, um, you know, I, I think that there are ways in which things that are kind of like rules, but are not these kind of macro tailor um, uh, or quantity theory kind of rules, but are more kind of focused on this financial cycle might address some of the kind of um, concerns about, you know, leaning uh, against the kind of cycles that I think that he's kind of concerned about these kind of financial instability um, booms and busts. So, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, that's kind of a different perspective. That's not to say that, like, you should have a rule that says whenever credit growth is yeah, you know, but just, but just I, I agree. I agree. I agree with what you're saying. When just to, to clarify my point, but those 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 more specific rules or the more, those more targeted rules are actually specifically behavioral. They have specific behavioral implication, 
that are not, right. and, and so you're actually moving into the argument, like you're not trying to just abstractly stabilize money supply. You're actually trying to specifically in like in the credit uh, or in the other rules you, you mentioned, uh, the more narrow you get, it's actually much more of a behavioral equation you're trying to influence rather than some sort of abstract or no, no nominal number that somehow has value accepted and somehow stabilizes something. At least that's my view. Maybe you Maybe you yeah, can... no, no, I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't saying this as kind of an alternative. I mean, I was just kind of, uh, yeah, uh, uh, offering a slightly different perspective on the, on the, on the topic. So I think, yeah, there, there are kind of interesting questions about, you know, first of all, what are your kind of prior assumptions about how kind of macro cycles evolve and what, you know, the role of central banks should be to kind of address them. And then two, you know, what kind of tools are kind of best suited for those things and, you know, whether that's kind of, broad rate policy and kind of rules tied to that, or if it's more kind of macro prudential or, or this kind of thing. Um, yeah, so I, I think there's kind of a lot of different directions uh, that we can kind of talk about if we go through the book related to those, but I, I think that that's something kind of behind a lot of this. I think there are quite a lot of interesting things to that you guys covered. So um, first on the on the speculative and non-speculative or productive credit. Um, I always found this distinction as, as, as being a bit blurred, but even if we stick to it, um, I don't think that uh, leaning against the wind in the in the nominal sense, as we'll say tightening policy by, by raising interest rates uh, is able to uh, by itself differentiate uh, which type of credit it, it hits. Um, I'd say that this is much more on the on the macro prudential slash regulatory um, side to, to to address the um, to, to to address the the, the rising instability uh, uh, or or, or, or uh, rising credit that is of a sort that we don't want. Uh, but well, for example, um, uh, well, Glass Steagall would be would be one or. But to, 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 to give a more timely example, ECB is, uh, is doing the tell truth that have some, some conditions. So, um, uh, so that the, the, the healthy type of credit to the, to the real economies and courage is essentially uh, making banks that do that more, uh, more profitable. Uh, so, so there is some monetary policy, um, uh, monetary policy um, flair to it, but, uh, but I think it's, it's mostly uh, it's mostly how we uh, how we set constraints for the uh, for the banking sector and the and the shadow banks, right? Because most of the fragility that arose in the wake of uh, 2008 crisis was essentially in this kind of gray area uh, around banking, supported by banking, all those special vehicles and um, and, and stuff like that. So so it wasn't um, it wasn't uh, the, the productive credit boom uh, boom per se. Uh, and I don't think the hiking interest rates, if if, if the Fed uh, would hike uh, two three quarters uh, before hiked more, uh, would would prevent these kind of fragilities uh, from um, from building building up. Uh, and even I'm just uh, looking at page seventy. That's the the, the, the last sentences of chapter three. Uh, there's an interesting part which uh, uh, in which uh, Ferry says that. Uh, the thinking was that the higher rates uh, also meant that uh, the refinance of maturing uh, of maturing speculative positions was achieved only by pledging even greater future cash payments, which meant that even successful refinance tended to increase fragility, which kind of turns our, I think, usual thinking on its on its head that uh, the higher rates may even be uh, conducive to to to, to increasing um, uh, increasing uh, fragility in the um in the financial system uh on the behavioral uh and and, and central bank, bank targeting i think i uh, yeah i've raised a couple of, of, of great points um and what i'm uh, what, I'm th what i was thinking about when i was listening to you is that uh, we may be uh or we may have uh, uh gone into the world in which this this dance between the, the central bank and uh, or central bankers and uh, um, and private markets uh, is uh, is sy symmetric or more symmetrical than it used to be in the way that central banks are uh, 
much more responsive to their expected to, to, to the reaction they expect from the financial markets, which may be uh, which may be getting binding much more quickly than it used to be the case before. At least that's these are the lines along them I, I'm thinking. Uh, some some I know guys that you uh, discussed the the rise of uh, rise of carry. Uh, so this kind of central bank put uh, type of thinking that uh, the central bank cannot say um, tighten too much because it uh, fears the, the the market backlash and it, in a way we are endogenizing the uh, the, the the monetary policy or uh, the, the the interest rates and and they are stuck but they are not stuck because of the the real the fundamentals they are stuck because of the of the way central bank expects the, the, the markets to react if. Uh, if they were to, 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 to diverge from, say, the saving the, the stock market. Yeah, so, so I agree, but I also, on your kind of first point about um, kind of how do we think about kind of financial stability and, and monetary policy in the relationship. But I think also there's a sense in which, I mean, the, I, I think that this has kind of become a lot of the kind of conventional wisdom now, right? Where, you know, people kind of think monetary policy kind of broadly speaking is, is like generalized interest rate policy. And then anything that we're concerned about for financial stability should be dealt with kind of macro Peru, uh, prudential policy. And, and I think that that's, that's probably sensible. I, I think that I guess what I'm kind of getting at, and I think that he's kind of getting at a little bit in this book, is that those things used to not be as separate as they were. And in fact, you know, I mean, before, you know, the, the Fed kind of shifts to having a policy where it's doing these kind of open market operations, and in other central banks, kind of historically, they operated primarily through their kind of discount window, right? And so the interest rate was sent through, you know, was I mean, when people talked about the interest rate, they were talking about the discount rate at the discount window facility, and that depended on what kind of collateral you know, banks were allowed to bring and this kind of thing. And so there's this kind of very explicit choice by central banks to move from you know, accepting loans as uh, collateral at the discount window in order to kind of set general financial conditions to one where they're using government debt to do that because it's viewed as kind of quote unquote more neutral. And, you know, maybe, maybe that's good, maybe it's bad, you know, maybe it's useful to have these things separated or not. But um, there's a sense in which, you know, the kind of, for, uh, and I'm sorry to keep referring to like other books and stuff, but just because, you know, the reading group has kind of talked about some of these in the past and they're very relevant. I mean, one of the things that, for example, the French central bank would do is it would, you know, require different haircuts for different kinds of collateral. I mean, all of the discount windows do, but, you know, when they were kind of operating their kind of main policy in order to tighten conditions or loosen them, they would, you know, have a preference for certain kinds of collateral. Um, they would accept what they called kind of investment credit, which was like long-term credit to, you know, profitable companies. Um, and they wouldn't accept, you know, uh, collateral from, you know, bad lenders and, and this kind of thing. So there's a sense in which, you know, I think some of these things used to be much kind of closer uh, and more related. And over time, they've kind of diverged and become separate functions of the central bank. And, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's useful to have them kind of separate. But uh, to, to me, kind of, anything that the central bank is doing in order to affect kind of broad macro variables, whether they're real or financial, is something that I would kind of consider monetary policy. And perhaps that's kind of semantics a bit. But, um, you know, I, I think maybe this gets back to Jay's kind of point early on. I think that if we just kind of call a monetary policy, broad interest rate policy, and we kind of um, treat everything else as kind of uh, as, as regulatory policy um, or as something kind of ancillary, uh, I, I worry that it, it leads us back to a place where um, central banks don't have this kind of important role in, in financial stability. I mean, you could imagine, and I, you know, I don't know if I would make this argument, I, 
maybe, maybe I would, I would have to think about it. But you could imagine an argument where someone says that, you know, what is really important is the financial cycle. And if you manage that, that the real side will deal with itself. Maybe true, maybe not, but like, you know, not a totally unreasonable perspective. And if that's the case, then the most important thing that central banks are doing is kind of, you know, managing uh, the financial cycle through macro Peru. And, um, you know, that should be something that is kind of more fundamental in our macroeconomic thinking rather than treat it as something that is, you know, a kind of more, uh, a more, you know, uh, yeah, an ancillary kind of uh, duty of central banks. Yeah, so I want to um, I want to shift into there's a lot of stuff we could discuss forever here. Um, I want to shift a little bit into some balance sheets. Oh, how do I do that? They changed the interface here. I can't share a window. Hold on. I think I'll have to share my screen. Well, let's just share my whole screen here. Okay. So, um, so we had uh, kind of these rules of before World War II, um, you know, the Fed, this is before World War II, chapter three, the Fed intermediating um, and uh, managing borrowed reserves um, as, their, as their monetary policy. So borrowed reserves are um, how much, uh, how many reserves are people borrowing at the discount window? Um, so the surplus banks would hold extra reserves at the Fed as their, as their asset, and the deficit banks would um, have a, a discount loan liability um, uh, from the Fed uh, in order to fill their, uh, their funding gap, right? Um, so you have these, the surplus agents with all the excess reserves, and you have the deficit agents uh, with the discount loans. And the Fed is essentially acting as an intermediary here. Um, you know, these reserves are really, um, you know, funding the loan, the discount loan uh, to bank A. Um, obviously, there's more than just two banks, um, but this is kind of a, a simplified uh, version of it. The problem is that um, what, and this is just kind of a, a condensed version of that where you where you don't separate out the steps of the bank A borrowing, it's just getting into the final position here. The problem is what happens if the banks are um, just borrowing from each other uh, bilaterally uh, and not involving the Fed? You have the same situation, it's just disintermediated, right? You have the surplus banks uh, lending to the deficit banks, they're just not doing it through the Fed's balance sheet. Um, so once banks started borrowing from each other more uh, in the Fed funds market, um, you have this problem where um, you know the Fed can't really um, judge anything about how tight the money market is based on borrowed reserves um, because people could be just skipping the Fed's balance sheet altogether. And that's kind of you know how it has been or how it was up until the financial crisis. Like, nobody's using the discount window. Um, so you have uh, banks borrowing, borrowing from each other. Um, so what they did- you say no borrowed reserves, you mean not borrowed from the Fed. They're, they're clearly borrowing them from each other, right? That's right. The term borrowed reserves and targeting borrowed reserves, that means yeah. borrowing at the discount window. Yeah. yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. Um, so what the, what the Fed ended up switching over to doing was targeting um, what they call free reserves, which are um, excess reserves minus borrowed reserves. Um, so the borrowed reserves are always going to kind of correspond to the discount loans. So they kind of kind of net out, and whether people are doing uh, their um, interbank lending, uh, overnight lending, or whatever uh, through the Fed's balance sheet or um, you know between each other, um, it's going to net out either way. All that activity is going to net out, um, but the free reserves are not going to net out because you have um, essentially what you're doing is you are, yeah. So here's, here's an expansion of free reserves right here. Um, what you're doing is you're having the Federal Reserve um, snatch up some, some treasury bills from the banking system as a whole and replacing it with reserves. So now there's kind of extra reserves in the system as a whole that aren't, uh, it's not that some banks have extra reserves and other banks are deficit agents. You know, th that's certainly happening, but you've netted all that out. And then the Fed targets just kind of the overall excess reserves for the entire system. And that's, that's free reserves. Um, so they can go. Sorry, I, yeah. I, I'm still a little confused. Mm -hmm. I, under, I, I kind of understand the definition of borrowed reserves and excess reserves, but free reserves, 
is is unclear to me. Yeah, so free reserves it's is just sound, excess it reserves. It sounds a lot like excess reserves. It's excess reserves minus borrowed reserves. So you're um, you're netting just out. Really clear. Yeah. If if a if the central bank creates a hundred in reserves, and banks require you know fifty percent of them to meet their required reserve uh, their reserve requirements, then fifty percent of them are excess, and so then zero are free. I I, I, I don't understand. Uh, I think it's more that that 50 are free. So if, if banks are borrowing from the discount window to meet their reserve requirements, you know, a deficit bank is borrowing um, and then the surplus bank is lending. So the surplus bank would have had, you know, excess reserves perhaps, and the hmm. deficit bank has not enough reserves. You're, ne you're netting that out um, when you're calculating free reserves. So free reserves are the reserves that, um, if you distributed all the reserves to the banks uh, as best you could and eliminated all the surplus and deficit agents, um, so everyone kind of had exactly the right amount of reserves, um, how many reserves are left over? Those are the free reserves. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. I, I th mm. So, so it's, so it's a bit like uh, the liability side of QE, right? That they're kind of adding the reserves to the whole system without using the borrowing, uh, the discount window, right? That's right. It's the liability side of not just QE, but open market operations. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I, th I think the nomenclature here might be a little bit different than, than some places you use, but it's fine. I, I, I understand. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, and another way of thinking about it is that excess reserves are on the balance sheet of an individual bank and free reserves are excess reserves for the banking system as a whole. Uh, does that make sense? Okay. Um, so uh, so here's just going in the other direction. So when the Fed is expanding free reserves, they're expanding their balance sheet on both sides. Um, and when they're contracting free reserves, they're contracting their balance sheet uh, on both sides um, and, uh, and replacing reserves in the system uh, back with treasury bills again. Um, so this is kind of, um, we, talk, we were talk, talking about, well, what were the rules they actually used? Well, these were the two, two, the two main rules that, um, that Marilyn was talking about in the book um, was targeting borrowed reserves and, and targeting uh, free reserves and then eventually targeting interest rates. Um, so that was kind of, kind of the progression there. And, and this stuff is actually not, not in the MOOC. He doesn't really talk about this in the MOOC. Uh, so it's interesting to, to see it in the book. Uh, and he didn't put balance sheets for it because uh, he hasn't gotten to really the balance sheets uh, part of the book yet. Um, so um, it was fun to go through and do these. Um, these two balance sheets right here are kind of what Minsky's talking about. He's talking about um, how the central bank interacts with the, um, with the banking system. Uh, and the idea is that, okay, if you're in a time of crisis, um, then what happens is you're moving the interbank lending onto the Fed's balance sheet. So it's being intermediated through the Fed. Instead of banks borrowing from each other, they borrow from the Fed. Instead of banks lending to each other, they lend to the Fed. Um, so, so for here, you have you know, a Fed funds loan and for whatever reason, um, you know, your counterparty doesn't wanna roll it over. Uh, bank B refuses to roll over A's funding. So now bank A goes to the discount window and bank B is just holding reserves at the Fed. Um, so now you're back in a situation where the reserves are IOUs uh, for the discount loan. And this can be analogous to any other facility that the Fed uses um, that does something similar, um, you know, not just the discount window. Um, but this is kind of what happens in a time of crisis. It all moves on to the Fed's balance sheet where it's all intermediated uh, by the Fed instead of, instead of banks borrowing from each other. And then Minsky says, okay, once the crisis is over, then the Fed sets, you know, um, bad prices on things and then the, the banks start uh, lending to and borrowing from each other again, and the Fed's balance sheet shrinks back down. So that's what he's imagining. This is kind of his alternative perspective uh, compared to like the Keynesian and the, and the, and the monetarism uh, that they're talking, or that Merling is talking about at the end of uh, chapter three. So I just wanted to put that, uh, put that in balance sheets right there. Yeah, I think, um, you know, this kind of reminds me of, and you've seen, we, we haven't gotten to the, to the part where there are balance sheets, given the time, we, we probably should go there. Um, and I, I got to say that it kind of in, in chapter four, um, the kind of the kind of pedagogical tool that he uses to explain how 
different pieces of risk are kind of um, separated out and this kind of parallel loan uh, perspective that you can do in T accounts to talk about, you know, uh, interest rate risk and credit risk, which he also does in, in the course, I think is one of the most impressive, like pedagogical tools I've kind of ever seen. Like it really made clear to me how, um, you know, how, uh, oh, I see what we're going to hear, uh, how, you know, these kinds of, these pieces can be kind of separated in the way to think about the, um, how they kind of map into different institutions and stuff. So uh, I, I really, really, I enjoyed revisiting this. I mean, every time I try to like think about this stuff, I go back to the course and, and the lecture notes and I forgot that it was in the book, but you know, I read it so long ago, I, I didn't really remember. Um, but I, yeah, I just, I, I, I really like this part. I think it's very well done. And just yeah. to, add to this last point, I think it just emphasizes the dealer function as well. The fact that there's different risk markets that, that, that happen, it just points out that there's a huge infrastructure that, that was built up to make that happen. And we've just taken that for granted by not just macro theory, but financial theory. It takes it for granted that there is liquidity making the system run. And that's to Mateos's point earlier. Like, if we think this that this is the, the defining feature of modern finance, then we cannot make this somehow a sort of residual thing, shadow banking. That's why Perry actually doesn't use the term. This is how finance works. The dealers are at the center of making these markets work. They need to be supported. Liquidity needs to be supporting these markets. We can't think of this as somehow being something, you know, abnormal or something else. You know, that's why he uses, in my my view, I don't usually like the way he, he phrases it, the natural way for a modern finance to work, uh, natural, which is what he's defining. But he makes it very clear that for these risk markets to operate, dealers have to be in place. These dealers are requiring liquidity and that's what broke. This portion is what broke in the system. And that's why we're wondering uh, why the hell we didn't have a theory about why, uh, how to support the system is because we didn't have a theory about liquidity and dealers uh, and didn't understand that this very elegant model, that's the crux of it. Uh, it's not that hard. Like there's not a big theory that needs to be done, but the primary function of central bank is to support these payments from uh, these these liquidity crises to be to emerge, and we didn't have a theory about the primary function for this modern update of the old rule of lender of last resort for this system. So that's the and that's actually what the Bank of England has done in the meantime, right? Now we have to support markets, uh, liquidity uh, market mechanisms, market makers, and not just banks. The liquidity doesn't only emerge in banks. That's the crux we've also had. We think somehow liquidity is only a banking thing. Liquidity is not necessarily only a banking thing, it's a market thing, it's a dealer thing that needs to be supported as well. And that's actually the crux of the book, I think, besides everything else. The fact that we've lost completely the conversation, the playbook about that is what Perry is, is trying to re-excavate. Re and the fact that we're sort of dealing with all kinds of other tools uh, to try to solve this problem is actually re-aggravating the problems potentially, right? If you're trying to say, okay, we have to think about this dealer, this, this system breaking, like we think about a banking system, like there's some sort of regulatory thing, then you think about capital requirements as the primary thing that solves the problem, not liquidity provision or an, an update of the infrastructure. You completely miss the point of what this crisis was about. Uh, you misidentify the crisis. It's, this is somehow a rogue system. So that's exactly why I like to think about what is Perry actually talking about here? We're not talking about some abstract thing here. He's actually putting like, a major failure of how we're thinking about the crisis, number one, we don't have the tools, the intellectual tools in, in starting the conversation too. And therefore all the policy proposals in solving the crisis, even today are all missing the primary point about what, this, what actually is the primary thing we need to, uh, to deal with in order to, to do that. And the only group actually has done it in, in Perry's way is the Bank of England to sort of, and the FSB, right? They've said, okay, we're looking now, we're shifting uh, our view about liquidity provision and our liquidity lines as central banks go also not just to banks but to dealers to any 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 group of uh, any institution that's providing liquidity to the system and that might dry up uh, in a crisis and that's and that's something we didn't understand now we're providing liquidity to those groups 
that's all Perry's actually saying. That's the crux of the book. And everything else is sort of add on to that. But that's the primary function of traditional central bank updated to the modern world. And everything else is our, our own interpretation based on secondary and, and third functions of central banks that can stabilize in a Keynesian way or a non-Keynesian way other macro uh, dimensions in the hot for wind, leaning against the wind. We don't want to bubble because we don't want to, we want, don't want to have emergency. We want to solve the emergency before it gets there. Those are other secondary questions that we can all discuss and we've discussed at length. But I just want to make a point clear here at this point since Gwyn said that this is for me is the key uh, to Perry's book. And that's why he doesn't get into other discussions because it would distract again from this conversation, right? It would distract from this conversation of liquidity is central. We don't know, we don't know we've lost liquidity. We need to discuss liquidity. So that's basically what I just want to plug in here. Yes. Uh, I agree with that. Um, I think, I think, yeah, I mean, he's, he's definitely uh, focusing on that aspect of, uh, of monetary policy and putting that as the, as the primary uh, role of the Fed. And certainly it's the thing we care about the most when we're talking about something like a financial crisis. Uh, so if you have a book that's um, supposed to be talking about uh, a crisis, it's definitely what you want to bring, uh, bring front and center. Um, so and, and we were talking about kind of um, the intuitive way in which he kind of introduces uh, the idea of a swap. Um, so as you can see on the balance sheet, it's just a loan. It's just as if, you know, a bank uh, is expanding, you know, it's, it's, it's a loan in both directions, right? Um, you've got, uh, well, it's easier to see... It's easier to see perhaps here where you consolidate company A and company B. You know, the company A is expanding uh, its balance sheet on both sides. Company B is expanding its balance sheet on both sides. And they happen to be going through this intermediary, uh, JP Morgan. And it happens to be the case that company A is actually two different companies, one in the United States and, and one in, in uh, England. Um, but it really is the same thing. It's just, you know, if, this, if these were dollars, right, um, then it would just be, you know, well, for some reason, uh, one uh, entity wants to hold the other entity's liabilities and the other entity wants to hold the original entity's liabilities. So that's a banking action, right? You know, you can think of, of, of this as deposits and, and this as a, as a loan or something like that. Um, it's the same, it's the same thing on your balance sheet, uh, when you have the parallel loan. Um, so then we move we move on from there to talk about um, a currency swap broker who's who's you know matching up company A and company B um, and if one of them you know defaults um, you still you know you have your you know if they default on dollars you still have your pounds as collateral and and vice versa um, so you just need to find another uh, counterparty who's who's willing to do a new a new swap with you it's not completely riskless but it's not. Um, it's not the end of the world um, if if someone doesn't uh, um, come through on on a currency loan. Uh, and the forward exchange contract um, uh, it reduces the balance sheet size because there's no um, notional loan. There's no kind of principal that's being paid. People are only going to be paying the difference at the end, right? Um, but it also you know reduces the problem of oh now I have now I'm stuck with all these dollars and I have to find someone else to swap them with. Really, I just have to swap the. Um, you know the the, the promised uh, interest payments or or um, however it's being set up. You don't have to um, even if you're up here and these two uh, company A and company B did a forward exchange contract bilaterally with each other. Um, neither one would be stuck um, with. Uh, with money because it would just be about um, you know those those differences in interest payments and stuff like that uh, at the end. Um, probably they need the money. They need the money to play around with. But um, you know a lot of times uh, that's not the case, and you can do it through these these uh, forward exchange uh, contracts. So this uh, this introduces the idea of a swap. So this is kind of the simplest. Um, swap that you can do because it's it's just uh, it's just a normal loan in terms of balance sheets. It's just one side of it is in one currency and another side of it uh, is in another currency. Um, so, so yeah, I think that's pretty straightforward. These balance sheets down here are actually from the MOOC. Uh, in the MOOC, he goes deeper into okay, well, what's happening with dealers um, and what do those balance sheets look like? What you know, and the balance sheets of the central bank and 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 all of that. So you have like central bank backstops and all of this. Um, so the course really takes this tiny section and expands on it a lot more. Um, and he's you know uh, Perry's been working on global money, so 
foreign exchange and all of that, you know, I'm, I'm excited to see, you know, um, you know, what he, what he comes up with in his book. Um, but this, this part is just kind of the, the book we're reading now just gives us a taste of what's going on with foreign exchange and how those foreign exchange prices are determined. He brings up um, covered interest parity and page uh, 82, I want to say, page 80, no, page 76. I don't know why I thought it was going to be something. But page 76 is the one where he really explains, you know, what uh, covered interest parity is. Um, I'm, I, you know, get stuck on this every time. You know, I have a feeling like he's, he's talking about pounds over dollar, but then is he talking about pounds per dollar and stuff like that. Um, my read of it is, let me stop sharing for a moment. It's a lot of balance sheets. Um, my read of um, in chapter four is, it, it, I, don't know, I don't know how closely you guys read this page or if you just kind of took the, the numbers and, and variables for granted and stuff, um, but it looks like Perry might be getting the quoting convention backward in his math or I'm getting something backward in my head uh, and then fixing it at the end. So, um, so pounds over dollar um, is the dollar price of a pound. And pounds per dollar is the pound price of a dollar. I, I, it's not intuitive me, uh, for me uh, to, to quote exchange rates. But I think the conclusion that he comes to um, is, that, um, the, is that the forward rate should overvalue the, um, the reserve current or the funding currency, right? So if the world funding currency is the dollar, the forward rates between the dollar and all the other currencies in the world, you know, everything else being equal should overvalue the dollar. They should exceed kind of the, the expected uh, uh, spot rate in the future in terms of, yeah, the, the, the dollar, uh, the dollar, yeah. I, so I, I don't know. Did, does anyone have like a really strong intuition for this? And you can just kind of like walk through it. Did anyone kind of like go deep on this part? I struggle with this, and I struggle with it in the in the lectures uh, as well, and also in his his essential hybridity uh, 2013 paper. And he uses different coding uh, conventions in different places too. Uh, I go ahead, Win. No, I was just saying I didn't look at it closely. Well, we're going to do it in the course, maybe. I think, uh, I think let's let's try to make an effort. To, I think Perry, I think if I remember correctly, he does mention that he does things differently with a quoting convention that does ring the bell. Um, so we can just take some time to, to work it through that. I have another interesting question, which, which is very random, but I thought we have this whole general narrative against speculation, right? Everybody is against speculation. Everybody's critical of speculation. But the point that Perry makes in this section is essentially that we need speculators for the whole system to run, especially if you want to be safe, especially if you want safety and you want to be, uh, the speculators are ones who are taking the risk off your hands. Um, so I just thought maybe, wow, this is the safer you're trying to make the system in the, in the modern financial way, the more you need speculators, the more you need speculation. So I was just like, mm, this actually yeah. is just a really, a really interesting uh, thing in my head for me. I think this is, a, this is actually a, a pretty common thing in some of the finance literature is there's this kind of idea that like in order to hedge risk, you need someone on the other side to be speculating on that risk. Um, and in some sense, you know, there's like a kind of a whole theory developed that, you know, speculators can potentially earn a premium because some people are particularly risk averse about a particular risk and, and willing to pay for the kind of security of, of having that hedged. Um, and I think you're right. I mean, I think that there's kind of, maybe there's kind of two ways of thinking about, you know, speculation here. There is like a, a kind of you know, what is almost in, in kind of some of the financial theory thought of as like a noise trader or someone who like, you know, is willing to kind of trade, you know, the little ups and downs of the market and, and make a quick buck um, versus, you know, what I think in kind of chapter three, he talks about as speculative credit as being kind of this more kind of uh, broad trend in, in lending and credit to increasingly less credit worthy individuals. And so, you know, maybe, yeah, 
th those two things may be related, but I feel like uh, in some ways they're kind of different different ideas of speculation. And I think you're right that here the speculator is, you know, an important piece of financial market plumbing that is not something that we can like uh, easily just kind of say we want to get rid of or something. They they play an important role um, in the market functioning. Yeah, I guess there's different kinds of, I, I like the distinction you're drawing between like just kind of the immediate term uh, noise uh, traders who are kind of uh, buying the dips and and selling the the blips and and versus like people who are betting on kind of a longer term uh, upward movement in markets or something like that um, or, or a crash. Um, yeah, yeah, and I think, I, I think, you know, if we, if we take the kind of, in the in the latter in the latter perspective, you know, if we take the kind of Minsky perspective, which then also uses the word hedge, and so everything gets very convoluted. But like, you know, as I recall, in it's actually been a while since I, I looked at the kind of old Minsky stuff. I, I should refresh myself on that at some point, or maybe we should read some of it in in the reading group at some point. But um, you know, there's the kind of relatively safe kind of lending, which is against you know. Uh, current kind of income and as you know as the market gets more um uh, as the market gets kind of more uh frothy people then will accept collateral in instead of income as you know what is securing credit and so then that moves in the direction of something that's kind of more speculative um you know while yeah here i think the idea of the kind of speculator is just like the yeah the person that's kind of uh, you know, maybe speculating in a literal sense of like, you know, they think interest rates are going to go up or down, but it's not, you know, kind of a question of whether they're moving from low quality kind of lending to high quality lending. Uh, but I mean, the speculator need not lend at all. I mean, they can, they can have a completely capital finance speculative position in, in this sense. I mean, they could take their hundred dollars and bet interest rates are going to go up and down. Uh, and that's kind of, speculation but it's not speculative credit in the like minsky sense right yeah that makes sense yeah so jay you have to head out do you have any uh final thoughts before you drop no i know we're here next time so i don't have any regrets uh, having to drop um but i hope uh you come on andrea you guys i'll listen if you have any final thoughts i'll listen to you and i hope you can see you guys next time again thanks for reading the book with us uh, yeah, thanks, Alex, for setting today's meeting up. Yeah, come so, and yeah, I mean, I was just gonna say, you know, in in about ten minutes, we'll hit the ninety minute mark. So, you know, maybe we should kind of. Uh, I was gonna suggest, unless people have kind of other last questions or comments, that maybe we kind of move to the last part of chapter four briefly which is this kind of slicing and dicing of, you know, we, we talked about how swaps were kind of built an intuition of them in the FX market. But, you know, I, I feel like a lot of the meat here is then how that comes to the kind of shadow banking market and the kind of slicing and dicing of, uh, of different kinds of uh, risk to different kinds of investors. Um, yeah, exactly. Carving off risk. Right. So we start with, and this is also on kind of chapter, uh, page 80 and 81, at least of my edition of the book, where we start with an investor who buys a corporate bond and that investor wants to get rid of some of the different pieces of risk. And so, you know, one thing that they could do is they could, you know, sell, you know, CDS, you know, which is this, uh, which takes kind of the, the credit risk part of it. And then someone who wants to hold the credit risk can, you know, this is Mr. Default, can hold on to that, but then, you know, sell or, or short a treasury bond, which gets rid of the interest rate risk. So they say, okay, I'm just focused on the credit risk. And then the person who gets the treasury bond can then, you know, short a short-term treasury bond so that the only thing that they have, you know, in, in in principle, the treasury bond is kind of enough to be interest rate risk. But if you thought that, you know, 
the their sovereign risk if you're doing this in you know some other uh, country that you know has major default risk or something like that, then selling the treasury bill gets you to a place where you know, the only thing you have is really kind of uh, pure interest rate risk, right? Um, yeah, and so I, I always thought that this was just like a really kind of impressive pedagogical tool here to to kind of build an intuition for for how these exposures can kind of net out and be sliced and diced. Yeah, and it's cool here because he starts out uh, with the parallel loan construction again. There's no, in this top uh, set of balance sheets, there's no credit default swap and there's no interest rate swap, right? Um, so so here, uh, Mr. Investor is paying Mr. Default the, you know, uh, the cash flows that he would get from a corporate bond and Mr. Default is paying Mr. Investor uh, the cash flows that he would get uh, from holding a treasury bond. But Mr. Investor is also uh, paying Mr. Default a premium because he no longer has that, uh, that default risk anymore. Um, and then uh, Mr. Investor also, you know, he prefers to hold a, a shorter term uh, asset than a longer term asset, because that's more like having a deposit. It's more like, oh, I can get my money out as soon, or, as, soon as I want. It's, it's more shiftable. The price is going to uh, fluctuate around less um, as, you know, market conditions change. So it's, so it's, easier, to, it's easier to sell a, a treasury bill. Um, I guess I don't know how that works out with an interest rate swap if you don't actually have a treasury bill to sell. Um, but uh, in any case, you get your um, you get your shorter term asset uh, and then you have a longer term liability. So you've, you've basically locked in uh, a funding rate and you have uh, an asset that's more uh, money like it's more like a deposit. Um, so that uh, so that's great. You've turned essentially. You started with a corporate bond, and you did these swaps, and you ended up with something uh, that's a lot like a treasury bill. It's not an actual treasury bill, but um, kind of you're uh, you're being promised the equivalent of a treasury bill, uh, and you're and you're paying for that. So you're not going to get as high of a return as you would have, um, but you've you you've uh, you've uh, insured your your risk there. So this you know explicit. Uh, parallel loan here is um, it can be uh, implicitly represented as a CDS. So this is the Mr. Investor buys the credit default swap and buys the, the interest rate swap. Um, and that's kind of how we, um, that's kind of the notation that we use with Perry Merling's MOOC and, and, that, and that Perry uses as well, um, just kind of the, the convention, yeah. He, and so then here, Mr. Investor is basically left with like, the risk-free rate, you know, right? Like, uh, in in theory, that should be kind of all that's left after he's kind of gotten rid of the credit right. interest rate risk. And the question is, why would you do this if uh, if you can just hold a, a treasury bill instead? Uh, and the answer is that. By going through this process, you can sometimes get a little bit better of a rate than you would get um, that you would get on a treasury bill. Uh, yeah, and you know. Also, this is something that, you know, uh, people kind of talked a lot about after the, the crisis and with securitization in general and stuff. But there's also like fees, right? And so you could imagine that, you know, going, doing the, doing this in for more complicated products could be complicated. And, you know, Mr. Default and Mr. Interest may not have any interest in building out, you know, a securitization desk or anything like this to, to deal with all of that. Um, they're happy, you know, if they can get just their little slice and they'll pay a little premium for it. And so you might get a transaction fee or, or pay some minor premium uh, for doing the service of slicing and dicing. Yep, exactly. So these are kind of the structures that were in place uh, going into the 2008 financial crisis. Uh, and the last ch chapter of the book talks about well, the, the next chapter, chapter five, talks about the dealers who make markets in these instruments and why they do that and what it looks like. And then the last chapter talks about um, how that all came unraveled uh, in 2008 and, and the lessons we can learn from that. So we'll be talking about the final two chapters uh, in a couple of weeks. Um, does uh, Giacomo, do you have any thoughts uh, at this point or are you good? Um, yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't have the chance to read the, uh, at least the chapter four, 
Um, no, I was um, interested in the, um, at the end of chapter four, uh, when um, basically Perry talks about the role of arbitrage. And uh, I found it interesting because he mentioned this um, regulation queue, which was basically a ceiling put on interest rates in the United States on deposits. And the, I found interesting this, um, I mean, is a reading of the story on of how uh, infl rising inflation and the ceiling on deposit uh, rates um, fueled the, the, I mean, the birth, let's say, of uh, the explosion of the money market mutual funds market because, let's say, wealthy households or uh, people that could access this market, unregulated market, could basically withdraw money from banks and when doing this kind of disintermediation to search for higher yields on uh, more unregulated markets, which also connects a bit to the discussion that we were, uh, that you were having before about um, whether everything should be in the hand of monetary policy or whether it's uh, better to segment the, uh, the managing of the financial cycle into uh, different, say, macro crew or monetary policy or other type of um, regulation authorities, let's say. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting question um, with regulatory arbitrage. I mean, in an ideal world, you'd have regulations that um, are doing what you want them to do, and then regulatory arbitrage is a problem. And maybe in a world where regulation is actually um, kind of getting in the way of, of, of good outcomes that you want, then then the regulatory arbitrage is helpful, but it, it would still be nice to uh, be able to manage things in such a way that um, you're doing it right and you don't have to worry about um, what you're trying to do being uh, kind of subverted by the market or something. I, I don't know, it's, it's a tricky thing. Um, uh, Andrea, uh, do you have any thoughts yet? You haven't uh, had any comments. All right, going once, going twice. Okay, uh, I think we're done. We're at the 90 minute mark. Uh, and in two weeks, we'll be talking about the final two chapters. Uh, looking forward to that. Thanks again. Thanks, Thanks. Thanks.